Coming up on Doctype, design patterns. If you've ever had a common design problem, chances are there's already an awesome solution. Then, learn how to shrink wrap that JavaScript with some minification tools. It's better than bad, it's good. It's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by the Frozen Rails Conference and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that doesn't know the difference between JavaScript and a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype is here to give you the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the internet. The good kind of emperor, right? Yeah, the good kind. OK, all right. Like a penguin. Oh, OK. The emperor penguin. They're, they're friendly, right? They're regal. OK. That's good. So let me just get out my uh, my iPad here that I don't have. Apple didn't send us a review unit. I don't know what's up with that. I know you're all like, hey, why don't you just go to the store and buy one? But damn it, we're in the past. I know. Today is actually Thursday, April Fool's Day. I know. And we're getting punked all day. I know. <laughs> we're the only fools here. So. Today, Apple released a page on their website at apple.com that shows all of the uh, websites that are iPad ready. And the thing that they're touting the most is HTML5 video. Lots and lots of HTML5 video. CNN, uh, Vimeo, just a ton of sites that I wasn't even expecting to see video out of the gate and just like everybody has HTML5 video. So that's gonna be a big win for web standards. You know, flashes might be taking a little bit of hit now that a lot of the big content brands are pushing out HTML5 video like crazy. Definitely. The days of Flash might be numbered. Well, for video at least. Maybe. Yeah, still got to play the games. Yeah, definitely. Today, we are going to be talking about minification in JavaScript and... Design patterns, I believe. That's right. Design patterns. I almost forgot. <laughs> Let's get into it. Now, it's easy to just borrow widgets and ideas from other websites, but chances are if you've seen a common design problem solved across a whole bunch of other websites, there's probably a design pattern for it. It's much better to gain an understanding of the essential components and understand how these design patterns work. Today, we're going to be looking at several design patterns from the Yahoo Design Pattern Library. Let's take a look. The first set of design patterns that we're going to take a look at involve pagination. Oftentimes, you'll have way too many things to display on a single page, and that's where pagination comes in handy. The most familiar type of pagination is search pagination, and if you have search functionality in your website, it's essential to get this one right. Similar to a typical search engine result page, you should have a row of page numbers with previous and next links on either side. When on the first page, the previous link should not be visible, and when on the last page, the next link should not be visible. The most important part of this is the numbering. The row of numbers should contain a maximum of 10 page links, and when on pages 1 through 6, the page links should always start at 1. However, However, when on page 7 and onward, the page link should start at the current page, minus 5. Item pagination eliminates the row of numbers and is best used for when the items of interest can be found on the first few pages. The difference here is that the controls are always visible. When on the first page, the previous link is disabled instead of invisible, and the same is true for the next link when on the last page. This prevents distraction to the user that would occur when using search pagination. Now, I'm a big fan of using tabs because they're based on a real-world metaphor and they give the user a visual cue as to their location in a larger set of information. The most familiar types of tabs are used for navigation. This is best utilized when there are three to ten category titles that aren't likely to change very often. When using tabs, make sure that the selected tab is more prominent than the others. Unselected tabs should appear to be further back in space to maintain the tab metaphor. Additionally, the selected tab should be connected to the surface area of the section that it's highlighting. In other words, it should have the same color as its associated section and it should not be separated by a border. Module tabs are different from navigation tabs in that they don't allow the user to navigate from one page to another. Rather, they allow the user to browse through small panels of content without refreshing the entire page. Let's say you're creating a web page for a new product and you want to present several of its features. Each individual feature doesn't really merit its own web page, but at the same time, you don't want the web page to get too long. A box with several panels and some tabs might be the perfect solution. There are tons of other design patterns to solve all sorts of common problems, so the next time you get stuck with a design problem, you should check out the Yahoo Design Pattern Library. 
Another great resource is the Apple Human Interface Guidelines, or HIG, for Mac OS X. While it doesn't relate directly to web pages, there's still a lot of great stuff in there. There's tons of other design patterns, and I'm sure we'll be covering them in future episodes of Doctype. Now when we come back, Jim is going to show you how to trim the fat off your JavaScript files. Frozen Rails is the first international Ruby on Rails conference in Finland. You'll learn from world-class developers like Chris Wanstrass from GitHub, Pratik Nayak from 37signals, and Yehuda Katz and Carl Erche from Engine Yard. In addition to the amazing speakers, there's a GitHub meetup and some awesome training sessions, like advanced Rails internals with Yehuda Katz and Carl Erche, as well as MongoDB with Mike Duralf. Best of all, it's held right in the center of Helsinki, so you'll see a lot more than just an airport hotel. Tickets are normally 129 euros, but if you use the discount code DOCTYPE, you'll save 10%. Not only will you save yourself some cash and experience Frozen Rails, you'll also be helping keep Doctype on the air. To learn more, check out frozenrails.eu and get your ticket to one of the coolest Rails conferences on the planet. How big are your JavaScript files? Nowadays, it's easy to rack up hundreds of kilobytes in our scripts. That's when you know it's time to minify. Performance is often a top priority when building websites for our users. This means minimizing the time between them requesting the information and then being able to see and use it. In episode 9, we looked at techniques to make our websites load faster, including using external scripts and gzipping all of our data. Today we're going to be talking about minification, or making our scripts as small as possible and still having them work. There are several factors that affect how quickly your scripts will be loaded, but the most major one is the download time. We can reduce our download time by removing any characters that are not absolutely necessary for the script to run. And that includes things like extra white space and comments. By removing those, we also make the script harder for other people to read, which might be exactly what you're looking for. Today we're going to look at just a few of the tools that allow us to do JavaScript minification. One of the most popular solution is Dean Edwards' Packer script. This is an online utility where you simply paste your code and click the button. It will return your code with all the extra white space and comments removed. This does a pretty good job of cutting the size of your scripts, but there is an option called Base62 Encode, which will in most cases make your script sizes even smaller. You can see this option outputs some very obfuscated code. So be careful, because for very small pieces of code, the overhead created by Base62 can actually make your script larger. Packer can also shrink variables by renaming parameters and local variables of your functions that are not visible to the outside world and changing them to one, two, or three character variable names. Yahoo's YUI compressor has been the go-to tool for command line minification. Generally, its file sizes are smaller than Packer's default settings, but larger than its Base62 encoded settings. To use it, you must have Java installed on your computer. Then you can download the compressor and place the jar file in with your scripts directory. Then open a terminal and type java-jar, the name of the jar file, and then the names of the files you'd like to compress. By default, it'll print the compressed code to the screen, but you can use the dash O option to specify an output file. YUI compressor is really nice because it can minify your CSS as well. Recently, Google has released their own minifier called the Closure Compiler. It's a lot like the YUI compressor in that it's a jar file that you execute on your files. You download it and put the jar file in your scripts directory and call it like this, java-jar compiler.jar, and then for each file you do dash dash js equals and then the file name you want to compress. You can pass multiple dash dash js arguments and they will be concatenated together. By default it will output to the screen, but you can route that into a file by using the greater than sign and the name of your out file. Clojure will generally produce even smaller files than the YUI compressor, and it actually reads and understands your code so it can make the optimizations. For instance, if you had the expression x equals 123 plus 456, it will replace it with x equals 579. It'll even shorten down to scientific notation if it makes the most sense. To get the most out of Clojure Compiler, you want to avoid using eval statements, because when they are present, the compiler has to assume that any variable could be read by name, so it can't shorten them. All of these tools create smaller file sizes, which is great, and it'll even often reduce the parse time since the engine doesn't have to look at all the extra characters. Now remember, you should be gzipping and setting the cache headers on all your files that you send out, so they only have to be downloaded once. Doing this will actually save a lot more time than any minifier would. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it. 
but where are you going to go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you going to use? Enter the code Doctype3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply. See site for details. Get your piece of the internet at GoDaddy.com. That's it for this week. Until next time, check us out at Facebook.com slash Doctype and follow at Doctype TV on Twitter. And if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, send us an email at questions at Doctype.tv. And if you subscribe by iTunes or RSS, you'll never miss an episode of Doctype, so why not? So until next Tuesday, remember that every great webpage starts with Doctype. <laughs>